Hi, everyone. Um, I am just going to ramble a little bit here while we wait for people to file in. Welcome, everyone, to this virtual event space. Just going to do a few back end things here again while people file in. It's so nice to see names that I recognize on our attendee list. Thank you so much for being here. All right. So I think I'm just going to I'm just going to dive in. Welcome everyone to this Montana Book Festival event featuring novelist Lauren Stevens and memoirist Judy Blunt. My name is Lauren Korn. I am the director of the Montana Book Festival. Uh, I'm also the host of Montana Public Radio's The Right Question. Um, we are right now, you don't know this, and it certainly wasn't advertised as such, but we are right now recording uh, what we hope to be a uh, either a right question uh, episode or a MTPR documentary special. So we are um, we are doing all the back end recording uh, for that as well. So thank you to MTPR for for that capability. Um, and before we dig into, I also want to thank Arts Missoula, the Whitefish Review, and MissoulaEvents.net uh, for sponsoring this event and and for all of our events. Um, like I said, this event is a little different than the rest of our Montana Book Festival events. Um, we're going to what I've been calling kind of gracefully straddle the lines between um, recording uh, this video for our uh, Montana Book Festival archive and recording for MTPR. Um, and so that's that's great. You get to see kind of like some some fun background in that. Um, so I guess, um, first, I guess I kind of want to introduce you to my production team, Beth Ann and Peter Hogue, Beth Ann Ostein and Peter Hogue, just so they, you guys know that they're there. Um, they're on the back end of things. Um, I don't know if they're going to turn their screens on or not, but just know that um, Beth Ann, oh, there's Beth Ann Ostein. She is my sound engineer. And Peter Hogue is my co-producer on the show. He edits everything together. So hi, you two, and thanks so much for being here. Um, and you know, most importantly, maybe, or equally important tonight, um, I want to introduce the authors who you are here to see um, and whose conversation you are here uh, to listen to, <laughs> um, Lauren Stevens and Judy Blunt. So I'm gonna read their bios and have um, them come on screen. Lauren Stevens is a widely published essayist and fiction and nonfiction storyteller. Her work has appeared in the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune, MacGuffin, the Jewish Women's Literary Annual, Forge, Crack the Spine, Amouge Bouche, The Writer's Launch, The Somerset Review, The Montreal Literary Review, and Tablet Travel Magazine, just to name a few. She is a two-time nominee of the Pushcart Prize and the book Paris Nights, My Year at the Moulin Rouge by Cliff Simon with Lauren Stevens, was named one of the best titles from an independent press by Kirkus. She is president and founder of the ghostwriting companies Write Wisdom and Bright Star Memoirs. Prior to establishing her company, Lauren was a documentary filmmaker. And today, um, I will say, Lauren was made a national commissioner of the Anti-Defamation League. So Lauren, welcome and congratulations. Um, you'll notice audience that there's someone next to Lauren. Lauren, do you wanna turn on your video? And yeah, there, there's Lauren and, and Dana. Dana is Lauren's husband. Um, and I'll have Lauren introduce Dana after I read Judy's bio. Uh, Judy Blunt, who is going to be talking with Lauren today about her novel, All Sorrows Can Be Born. Judy Blunt uh, spent more than 30 years on wheat and cattle ranchers, ranches pardon, in northeastern Montana before leaving that life to attend the University of Montana. Her book of poems, Not Quite Stone, won the Merriam Frontier Award and was published in 1991. Her best-selling memoir, Breaking Clean, was published by uh, Knopf in 2002 and met with wide critical acclaim. Judy is the chair of the English department at the University of Montana, as well as the director of the Creating Wri Creative Writing Program, pardon, and a professor of nonfiction. Judy, welcome. Judy, are you there? Oh, there you are, Judy. And if you could unmute yourself. <laughs> There you go. Hi, Hello. Judy. All right. Welcome, Judy and Lauren. And Lauren, if you could introduce Dana for us here. Yes. Um, Dana Miyoshi is my husband of 23 going on 24 years. Uh, we actually met at the Anti-Defamation League many, many years ago. We share a commitment to 
uh, civil rights, human rights, humanitarian causes. Um, and when he left in a very proper way, he asked me out and the rest is history. Um, Dana currently works for KPFF, uh, Structural and Civil Engineering based here. Uh, was actually based in Seattle, Washington with a very active practice in Los Angeles. Um, as some of you may have read, uh, my book is based on a true story or inspired by a true story. And that true story is the story of Dana's family. And he gave me permission to write the novel. So it was a very precious gift that he turned over to me. Thank you so much for being here, Dana. We appreciate it. I just want to quickly say that um, uh, and this, those of you who may not have read the book, I, I did in fact grow up in Glendive, Montana. I graduated from Dawson County High School uh, and I spent a year at the University of Montana. Um, I took a class with, with Professor Kittredge, who many of you may know, uh, many, many years ago. Awesome. So you've got all the all these connections too. Um, so audience, just before I hand things over to Judy and Lauren and Dana, I want to take care of um, a little housekeeping. Um, uh, I'd like to welcome you or we would like to welcome you to ask questions for Judy, Lauren and Dana. Um, there's both a chat function and a Q&A function at the bottom of your, your Zoom screens. Um, if you have questions, please put your questions in the Q&A. Um, that kind of organizes things a little bit better on our end. But do feel free to chat amongst yourselves in the chat. Um, Kate Morris, who is the Montana Book Festival Director of Outreach and Development is on the back end of things. Uh, she'll be monitoring the chat. She's already thrown out some links. Uh, you should definitely buy Lauren's book, All Sorrows Can Be Borns. Those, those be born. Those links are gonna be in the chat too. So please, please do that. Talk in the chat, ask questions in the Q and A. Um, we're gonna relegate your questions audience to the last about 10, 15 minutes. So I'll jump in and, and help um, moderate that if you will. Um, but, but for the most part, this is gonna be Judy, Lauren and Dana. So I would love to hand things over. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave you to it. So welcome the three of you and, and have a wonderful conversation. I think Lauren only jumps in if we totally are without something to say. So we'll assume that that is not going to be the case. I'm um, struck first by the title of your book and the quote that eventually arrives that says, all sorrows can be born if we have someone to listen to our stories. And that is the song of every homesteading family I ever heard. It's every immigrant who ever came. It's a common sort of global connection that I found incredibly moving. So how did you come up with the title of this book? Um, the actual title comes from a an attribution of a conversation between Isaac Dennison and Hannah Arendt. And it's actually not clear which one of the two said it. There are those who <laughs> vote on one side of the fence and those who vote on the other. But I think for anyone who uh, writes a memoir or a novel and they have imp something important that they wish to explore uh, something that may be having a, uh, a tremendous grip on their life, just the act of writing that story or telling that story is an incredibly liberating experience. And that, that occurred in this book uh, with my main character, whose name is Noriko, um, who was given the chance to unburden herself and tell the story of her life, of what happened to her and why she made the decision to give up her beautiful baby boy uh, in exchange for saving her husband's life. Uh, and by telling that story um, to the depth that she did, I think that it lifted a burden 
uh, off her heart and gave her a sense of freedom um, that she that she really did not experience prior to. But I think it is a universal theme in a way. Um, you know, I would turn it back to you. I absolutely loved your book, Breaking Clean. I shared with you that my writing teacher used that your book uh, in teaching memoir writing. I used it in a memoir writing class. And I wonder if you um, had that same experience in, in writing in writing your book about things that were extremely dramatic and um, tough, you know, tough to dig into. Well, tough, tough was sort of the, like the badge we wore, um, not Toyota, but tough. Um, in that, you know, where I came from telling stories out of school was, I'm very close like geographically to my family, to the people from the county I came from, Phillips County. And so it, it I think is a different dynamic in where we have uh, Dana who came from Japan to Glendive, Montana um, when he was a puppy, just a wee babe. Um, and uh, it's it's a different sort of, circumstance, I guess. Um, in my circumstance, I chose to tell my truth. And of course, anyone who has written a memoir knows if you are writing a memoir, you're writing your own version of events. And you can find 15 people who would have different versions of the same <laughs> event. So you had to walk that line. I, I want to walk you through that process of what it took to come to the way to tell this story, the story of a young child, a firstborn son who's given up and sent to America to become the only son of Japanese American uh, uh, you know, parents in Glendive, Montana, which is not New York City. So there's not like this enormous cultural center ready to welcome them they welcome them in a different way perhaps um, but it's a very different kind of approach to the story you had problems i didn't have i had problems you didn't have like thanksgiving dinner so you know <laughs> like, how do you uh yeah walk that one back home so how did you come to talk, talk us through the process of your coming to decide that fiction was the way to approach mm -hmm. this story? Well, I had spent a number of years uh, ghostwriting other people's stories, and I began by writing my mother's memoir, uh, which was an incredibly exciting experience for me to, to use my mom's story um, as a way to understand the history of women in the 20th century, how her life was emblematic of various touchstones um, in, in the evolution of women and their independence. Um, and so I had experience writing the memoir format and the nonfiction format, and I approached the book initially to be a memoir of the family and, and a nonfiction book. But what happened was as I began to dig into the story, um, and I will also refer to what the overarching question was that I was after, um, I realized that there were so many holes in the story, one of which was the fact that um, Ichiro, um, Dana's birth father had died, so I did not have his perspective, which was extremely important um, and influenced his wife's decision uh, and their decision to give away their little boy and many other uh, characters, some of which I made up out of whole cloth and some of which I resurrected from the dead because I felt that they had dramatic content. For example, the wicked stepmother, um, who 
uh, who Ichiro and his sister um, Mitsuko, um, his their father married a wicked stepmother after the first mother dies of tuberculosis, and she was the quintent. Quintessential. 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 Quintessential um, stepmother, you know, out of out of a horror fairy tale, literally. And I had such a tremendous time uh, using her character. And I found that she died after the Second World War. But I was so intrigued with her that I kept her on. And I carried her right through the entire book. And as I'm sort of plodding along with this book, which is now starting to blur between fiction and nonfiction, um, Dana one day said to me, you know, you're making so much of this up that I really think you're writing a novel and not a memoir. And at first, I almost felt a little hurt, you know, isn't this good enough? But then I realized that it gave me a tremendous amount of freedom in terms of using my own imagination and as I say, creating different characters that I felt could fill in um, some of the storylines and some of the holes. So um, that that became the sort of initial process where I planted my flag into the world of writing a novel. Um, the overarching question that I posed for myself um, and that I went in search of is how could a mother give up her little boy? I'm a mother myself. Uh, my son is now in his mid forties, but you know, I remember when he was a baby and I drew upon my own maternal experiences when I created the Hisashi character of bathing him and feeding him and taking him to the park and singing to him and doing all of the things that, you know, a loving mother would and could do. Um, but I, uh, I needed the toolbox of my imagination um, to really make this story uh, come to life. So that that became the process. And then, of course, comes the dreaded drafts. Um, I went through I went through something like seven or eight different drafts, several different editors who weighed in and helped me through. Uh, a bunch of beta readers who would say, you know, this doesn't make sense or that does make sense. And, you know, there's a piece of writing that almost it's like it takes a village, you know, to 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 create a book. You don't do it in a in a vacuum, as it were. And the last leap that I took with this book is I had originally had every character in the third person. And I took a writing class with Billy Murnett, who is a story editor over at Universal. And we had a weekend seminar and one assignment was, whatever scene you're writing, take that scene. And if you're writing it in the first person, write it in the third. And if you're writing it in the third, write it in the first and then read it to us. Well, the minute that I did that and changed Noriko's voice to the first person, I, I got so close to her emotions that I almost felt as if I would be, I became her voice. And I realized that that was the key to um, being able to um, communicate what was she was feeling in her heart. Because I think with every book, whatever the subject is, the the, the overarching um, goal that every writer has is that you feel what your characters are feeling, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You want them somehow to see various incidents and scenes through their eyes. And to the best of your ability to create a character that they will trust, unless of course you've deliberately decided to write an unreliable narrator. <laughs> And then that's a whole other set of, you know. Well, in which case you better be in fiction because the unreliable narrator in nonfiction does not get published very often. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I would say that 
what I noticed was that there is a, a, a through line, many through lines actually, but a through line of fact in your book. And it's easy enough if you're writing a nonfiction book about somebody else's life to get the biographical details, that's research. But to get the emotional thread that has to run underneath that is very difficult in another pe person, even if it's a person you know well. And this was not a person you had met, except through stories. Well, <clears throat> I had met Dana's birth mother. Um, in fact, our first meeting was the day he and I got married. Really? Yes. Uh, she came to the United States with her niece, and they spent a few days with us and talk about being nervous. You know, I didn't know how she would react to me, and and it that was very challenging. But um, <clears throat> I, <clears throat> excuse me, I then made the decision of going to Japan um, because I wanted to interview her at length. And my biggest challenge was she speaks no English and I speak no Japanese. And so I had to figure out a way for us to communicate. So I asked Dana's adoptive mother, who lives, who was living at that time in Vernal after living in Glendive, would she go with me to Japan? And she had not been back in 50 years or had seen her brother's grave. And, uh, you know, she thought about it and said, well, you know, who's going to feed Harry, my husband, while I'm away? <laughs> and I said, well, Mitzi, I think I think you can freeze some things and just get on the plane with me. So we spent 10 days in Osaka and I met members of the family. And every day we would religiously um, have about three hours of interview time where I would interview her and we'd sort of round robin. It was English to Japanese to Japanese to English. And then I brought back all the transcripts and had everything transcribed into English, which I was then able to use in many of the scenes that I then incorporated uh, into the novel. But of course, as I mentioned, Dana's birth father, Ichiro, whose name I keep, um, had passed away. Um, and some of the other key characters had also passed away. So um, I was at liberty to, you know, to do what I needed to do. But I will say that um, Dana's mom has a wonderful uh, memory and a very uh, good grasp of detail. So if I asked her, for example, what was it like auditioning for the Takarazuka, which was the uh, entrance academy to the Takarazuka Theater Company, which m maybe a few of our readers know that that is an all women's theater group. There's one in Osaka and one in Tokyo. And it's a tremendous review where all the parts, both male and female, are played by women. And the height of the Takarazuka star is the women who play the male roles. And this is what Noriko wanted more than anything in the world. She wanted to be in the Takarazuka and she wanted to play the men's roles. And she tries out and she fails. And she tries out during her 17th birthday and that's the cutoff. She can't try again next year. So this is the end for her. And she has to give up this amazing dream that she has for herself and think about, you know, what else is she going to do with her life? You know, now that the, the, the thing that meant the most to her is no longer uh, in front of her, you know, what, what's going to happen? And of course, that's when Ichiro comes on the scene. He's the tea room manager. He's extremely handsome, like my husband. <laughs> He um, plays the piano. He, he, he can't read music, but he plays the piano and he woos her over the piano. And they begin to sing together and one thing leads to another and they fall in love and get married. And then they have this beautiful little baby boy 
at which point uh, Ichiro contracts tuberculosis and everything goes to hell in a handbasket. All of the dreams that they have to start a business together, to build a life together, you know, falls by the wayside. And they then have to confront, you know, this very serious illness that eventually sends him to a sanitarium for nine months. And he is unable to really be an active father to this little boy. And things are left in Noriko's hands to balance working in the tea room, taking care of this little boy, running out to the sanitarium to see him. And, you know, you sort of wonder how is she keeping it all together? And she really isn't. Yeah. I think that's, you know, relatively clear. The aspect of coping with difficult decisions, if difficult situations. Right. My neck of the woods, we heard all sorts of stories about the depression, how, you know, boys from a big family might be sent out to make their own way when they were 13, 14 years old, because the family could not afford to feed them. Yes. And so it, it's not like it's relegated or sort of miscalls Japan as being you know, culpable in this any more than any other nation has been at one time or another. Um, what I found really interesting about a lot of this is uh, the way you structured your story. You've got a lot of through lines. You use um, the letters back and forth from Osaka to Glendive. You, you use um, varying points of view that shift from chapter to chapter among the characters of your book. But um, you also use cultural references uh, to sort of draw Japan's experience closer to the American sort of, you know, spatial mentality. Mm -hmm. And so we have the Kennedys that come up various times during the course of this book. Um, her, you know, the, the birth mother's uh, similarity to Jacqueline Onassis, her wedding dress. We've got, um, you know, the mentions of Kennedy's election and death going on in between that. Then we go to things that are even more recognizable to young readers, and that would be Toyota and Sony and all of the, the sort of uh, technical revolution of Japan that is caught in in the midst of this. And you had choices in that part of the facts of your story. Um, some of it is linked to uh, the stories you were told from one set of parents, the other set of, you know, the mother on the other side, other people, your research. But you had decisions that you made as a novelist to bring up, you know, you there's not so much about the dance and review and this sort of thing after, um, after she marries. But later on, there is a lot of sort of cultural reference, sort of giving a context to the story that is understandable, I guess, in American terms, is it as understandable in Japanese terms? Well, I really made an effort to um, sort of turn the history on its head. I think that, you know, we in the United States see the war and the aftermath so much from our own perspective, which is normal. Yeah. And I really tried to show what was happening in Japan and how the United States helped put Japan back on its feet economically through a number of different steps. One, um, you know, fighting against communism. All of a sudden, Japan became the bulwark against communism, and Korea was a huge gift in a way to Japan because we pumped in millions and millions of dollars. The Olympics was uh, uh, brought in a floodgate of money. And then the most important thing, I think, is the whole um, 
the whole decision by John Kennedy to improve Japanese American relations. I mean, he had worked with Edwin Reischauer, who he made ambassador to Japan. Uh, Reischauer was the son of ministers. He was married to a Japanese woman. He was extremely popular in Japan. Um, and he taught a whole cadre of American scholars, including Sumner Redstone, who I have come in there as an avatar. I think I call him Mr. Blackstone, yeah, Blackstone. Rather, than, <laughs> rather than Sumner Redstone. But he was in the process of creating a satellite um, service between the United States and Japan. And all of these factors were playing uh, toward shaping a new Jap Japan and a new Japanese economy. Um, and I felt that that was a very important context in which to also tell this story and, and gave the reader some hope that Ichiro would find um, a place in that economy. Yeah. But every time he would try to work and get a job and everything he did, he did well, something would get in his way. And that something was always, I did a lot of research on tuberculosis. And some of the things that happened to him were based on the drugs that he was given that really, um, for lack of a better word, messed up his mind and turned him from, you know, a glasses half full to the glasses empty. He just couldn't get out of his own way. And every time he would come up with a new scheme and see some way to, you know, create a life for himself and his family, things just fell apart to the point where he just made this decision, you know, let's just it be you and me, um, Noriko, let's give our little boy away, he's going to have a better life in America. And of course, in the midst of all of this tremendous economic boom, the United States was seen as, you know, a mecca of sorts, sure. of a place where anybody could do anything and become anything. And so the idea of turning his child over to his sister, who he dearly loved, and she could have no children, um, she had had two ectopic pregnancies and, you know, after nine years of marriage, had, had no children. All of a sudden, one she, day she gets a letter from Ichiro saying, I want you, I want to give you my son. And, you know, can you imagine what she must have felt? I mean, she needed to clear this with her husband, of course, but this was a dream come true. And then this little boy is put on an airplane in in Osaka, no, actually in uh, Tokyo. Tokyo, and flies to the United States all by himself. <laughs> and there are his, quote, new parents meeting him at the airport and taking him to Glendive, Montana, where he, you know, grows up in an, ex you know, completely different world um, than the one that he was used to. But I've asked Dana, you know, how much he remembers of his childhood. And do you want to speak to that a little bit? Well, I don't remember any of being in, in Japan. I mean, it was two and a half when I came to the United States. Yeah. And um, you would think, you know, getting on a plane by myself and traveling you know, across the ocean and all that stuff I would have memories of. But I don't remember any of it. Driving from San Francisco to, to Montana, uh, none of that. I don't remember any of it. I mean, where I found that information is I asked his um, adoptive father, Harry, I said, you know, what happened in the car when you were driving? And he said, oh, I started teaching um, uh, Dana, you know, Hisashi English. I would tell him the names of the cars that we would be seeing and so forth. And, you know, he was a very smart little boy and he picked things up quickly. So by the time he arrived in Glendai, he probably spoke maybe 30 words. And within six months, he was speaking English, which, you know, at that time, unlike today, the goal was to wash whatever language you were born with out of your mouth right. and to speak English and be a good 
little American boy, dress like a good little American boy, speak like a little American boy, eat like a little American boy, you know, do all the things that would make you fully American. And by the time he was five and a half or six, he was, you know, naturalized, a naturalized citizen. Um, so, yeah, but, you know, you think about it, but I've done research on psychology and the books tend to say that children don't really form memory until they're almost three. If they do, it's very, very unusual. Yeah, and oftentimes traumatic. So, yeah. and it's sensory, it's linked to senses right. um, as opposed to actual memories. And so it may appear in nightmares as, yeah. you know, fear of falling or whatever you see when you're three and look out a plane window. Yes. But it isn't especially a memory that you could record in your own mind 60 years later, you know. Um, it's uh, one of the elements, I think, that in, in talking with anyone who has based a novel on a true story, <clears throat> one of the one of the things that comes up is the the they want the dividing line people want to know okay so what's true and what's not what's real what did you make up and what's um and so oftentimes when things are fictionalized the names change and that's pretty much expected you say that uh the birth father's name was kept and uh, his last name was changed, but his first name was kept as it was, yeah. Yeah. which matters only to the people who will recognize it. You know, everyone else is clueless, but there <laughs> are some elements. Uh, the one thing that I thought was telling was the detail of, of sending the little heart shaped wooden box with the umbilical cord in it. Oh, that yeah. eventually finds its way into a safe deposit box in Glendive. Yes. Uh, did that actually come across yes. with you, Dana? Did that, um, did that, that and the picture of your parents, your birth parents, did you have that with you? Yes, I actually did have that with me. Um, and then I had, I had, she had given me a little note that said, had the date and time of my birth. I mean, I obviously knew the date of my birth, but I didn't know what time I was born. And so I asked her and she said, oh, don't you, didn't you have that paper? I gave, I put a piece of paper with you that had, had the exact time of your birth. It was when I gave it to the, uh, it was in with your things. I, I've never seen that piece of paper. I don't know what happened to it. Oh. Um, so, so unfortunately that got lost somewhere. But the notion of giving the umbilical cord away is very symbolic. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 because holding that umbilical cord keeps the tie between mother and child. So if you give that away, you're basically giving away, you know, the maternal tie. Yeah. And so when, uh, when his adoptive mother opens the suitcase and sees this box and she knows what's in it, it's a heart-shaped box made of Paolo Loina wood. She knows what's in there. And, you know, it almost breaks her heart because she's saying to herself, yes, Noriko is telling me I'm no longer this little boy's mother. Right. And yet she so viscerally is. Oh, in, yes. You know, in communications, the fact that she went with you back to Japan to help, that had to be an incredible, it wasn't a reunion, but it was in a sense, a reunion in spirit of these two women who had conspired to raise you, um, that had to be an incredibly emotional beating of minds. It actually wasn't a reunion because Ichiro didn't get married till after my adopted mother had already come to the United States. So they had yeah. actually never met. Right, but they had communicated right. over the fact of your adoption. They had, right. And so, you know, it isn't a reunion but it had to be, at least they had some understanding of one another when she went there. And so it's an unusual situation uh, to say the least, to have the birth mother, the adoptive mother, you know, translating for the Oh, wife. yes. 
So. Yes. And I wrote an essay about that. <laughs> I, I wrote an essay called Floating in Arashiyama, where I described the 10 days that we all spent spent together, like three little girls from school, are we, you know? <laughs> but um, the the what I find also um, was very hard, but important was um, Hisashi's reunion with Noriko at the end of the book. Yes. I don't know if I'm giving away a spoiler, but they do meet after 18 years. And uh, it's because, you know, Hisashi is floundering a bit. He's trying to figure out his place in the world. And he decides meeting his mother is going to give him some grounding. So he joins the Navy and requests posting to Japan, which usually means that they send you in the opposite direction. Sure. But for whatever reason, luckily, they sent him to Japan. And it took what, honey, almost two years before you actually met your mom? No, it was a little under a year. A little under a year. Um, he wrote a, a letter to his mother and said, I'm here in Japan. Um, you know, the next time I have shore leave, I'm hoping to come and visit you. And um, that, th that last scene, I compressed because I couldn't go on forever, but it was so highly charged. And that word that you use, the visceral connection, you know, because he, he is asked by um, Noriko, how did you feel when you saw me? You know, when you saw me standing at the hotel and he said, I, I had this visceral connection with you. I knew you were my mother, you know, even though I hadn't spoken to you, I hadn't seen you in all these years. Um, and then, of course, they go to a beautiful resort and they spend two days together somewhat awkwardly because, again, there's the language problem and her boyfriend is there and has to function as the translator, right. yeah. which, you know, has to be difficult. Uh, who is this guy? What is he to my mother? You know, um, and then the ending, I think I leave a little bit open so we don't know if if Hisashi comes back to see her again. Um, he promises he will. Will he? I mean, of course, I know the truth. I know what really yeah. happens, but I let I let the reader, I think, speculate a little bit. I think, yeah, there's a general assumption at the end that there has been a reconnection, that there has been like a magnet sort of coming together. There's been this click that will be very difficult to separate without them coming back together. And so... I think that's a good place to leave the experience, um, you know, the whole journey. And the, the idea that it, at one time this was a draft of 400 plus pages, the backstories of all of the characters involved are so interesting and unusual. The ones in Japan, of course, have that element of, my God, um, you know, your birth mother survived uh, Hiroshima. Uh, there, there are these elements that are in there and some are, you have decided you had to pull out. I was curious about how your adoptive parents met and wound up in Glendive, Montana, because that would seem like, you know, lobbing a spitball across the room <laughs> in a certain sense. It's like, really in Glendive? I'm not sure I know anybody who wound up there on purpose. So, you know, <laughs> I kind of... <laughs> well, I think Dana should I'm tell joking. that. Yeah, I think Dana should tell that story, but that was some of the pages that landed on the cutting room floor because I, you know, I just couldn't. I mean, honestly, the book was closer to 600 pages. <laughs> there we the go. First, the first or second draft, but you might address how they ended up in Glendive? Well, they met uh, during the Korean War. My adopted father was, was actually born in Colorado. Um, and he was drafted into the army. 
uh, served during the Korean War, but he, he was stationed in Japan. So he met uh, my adopted mother there. Um, they got married and came back to the United States. He came, they came, originally came back to Colorado, uh, but he got an opportunity to work for Halliburton in Glendive, Montana. And so that's how we ended up in Glendive. Yeah. What was the language element, um, you know, if your adoptive father was born in Colorado and she was born in Japan, did he share some language with her? How did they? No, it's, it's, uh, he speaks um, almost no Japanese and it's, which is, is um, his mother was actually from Japan. She was a picture bride. Oh, okay. came from Japan to Colorado to marry his father, my grandfather. And so she spoke no English and he spoke no Japanese. And so you can imagine having, trying to uh, have conversations with your mother when you both speak a, a common language. And then, um, you know, and then he, fortunately my adopted mother, Mitzi, uh, Mitsuko, she actually speaks, she was pretty fluent in, in in English, she had yeah. strongly accented English, but she was pretty fluent in English. Uh, I would, yeah, so she, I was she, going to guess that that's where the language barrier was broken, was on the Japanese side, just yes. through education. Um, we were not notably forward about teaching Japanese in the grade schools in America, um, you know, to our detriment, I would say. Uh, but that's an interesting element just the, um, you know, the, the Japanese American, and of course, during World War II, what a nightmare that must have been for them. Uh, were they part of the Japanese population that were interned? Were they, did you have that in your family's history as well? So my, uh, they, were, they grew up in Colorado. So uh, and for those of you who are familiar, the governor of Colorado, was is a big hero to the Japanese Americans because he refused to comply with any sort of internment, and um, and so. But my, I did have an aunt who was who was raised in California, um, and she was in fact interned. Yeah. Well, I know that the anti-Japanese sentiment could not have been too far from some element of your upbringing, just like in Japan, the anti-American sentiment that is expressed as part of um, uh, name freeze, name freeze, um, you know, the at the end of the war, uh, that there had to be elements of this, of writing this book that were sort of like walking on a tightrope. I mean, how far do you get into a particular great big issue uh, in telling a personal story that's kind of like a chalk line snapped through that story. How far afield can you get? Did you have that issue when you were researching? You know, um, I took a class with Ann Perry and she loves to write historical novels. And she always says, yes, less is more. You know, that you can give a telling detail Yes. that will open up a whole world. You don't have to load everything up, but what you do have to do is do your research. You know, you have to feel confident that when you write something that you can back it up. But you don't have, for example, when um, when Noriko goes to pick out her wedding dress yeah. and the wedding dress is a copy of Jacqueline Kennedy's wedding dress, and that year it was the most popular wedding dress. And it was so beautiful. And they would rent it for a day and she would wear two outfits. She'd wear the red kimono and be in a very traditional garb and for the church ceremony and they had a Christian church ceremony. She was dressed in that beautiful Jacqueline Kennedy dress. And the only reason I knew that is I did the research and I found out that that was the popular dress at that particular time. And yeah. I don't know if you noticed it, but I love fashion. So I, I have a lot of clothes you know, that <laughs> Nordico pines after. And the minute she gets a little money, she goes out and buys. 
and she, the lavender suit. Yes, the lavender suit. And of course, working in the European style tea room, she sees all of these very sophisticated foreign women and Japanese women too, who are dressed in the latest fashion. And on the other hand, we have uh, Mr. Blackstone's wife going to see Hanamori and having a dress made for her and Hanamori was an, uh, designed for the opera and her signature was the butterfly. And she designed these gorgeous suits that American women flock to wear. And she opened a store on Fifth Avenue. And I just love the fact that, you know, Mr. Blackstone says to Ichiro, please, you know, be there on time. My wife has a fitting. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> such an important event yeah it's an important event so um but uh one thing that i will add about um the language barrier um when uh dana's birth when dana's adoptive mother came to the united states as a bride as a war bride she had worked in the px the us px at lake otsu and she had worked for a Jack and Jill club, which was a club that was um, uh, designed for American GIs. So, you know, she had a passing knowledge of the language. I mean, nothing sophisticated, but she had enough words. And prior to Harry, she had an American boyfriend. And her dream was to marry him and come to the United States. And you know, live in Syracuse, New York, and live this very uh, upscale life. And unfortunately, he just took horrible advantage of her and left her basically, you know. Right. Yeah. Typical uh, war was, story, huh? Yeah, that was, that was very sad. And it was very common. You know, Japanese women were used by American GIs and just left behind and went back to this country and married their high school sweetheart. And that's what happened to uh, Mitsuko. And so when Harry uh, courted her, she wasn't sure she trusted him. But the fact that he was of Japanese background, I think gave him a leg up. And she knew that his mother would be extremely happy that he was bringing home a Japanese bride. Yeah. That's, um, what about um, the, uh, um, the element of, you know, your, your ghost writing background in, uh, I'm sure the, the real characters in your book had to make their peace with some element um, that is not as factual, but still getting to the ultimate truth. And for a writer, that is pretty instinctive. Truth is what matters more than fact oftentimes. Uh, the facts of how we got there are not often as real to us as the truth of that journey. And so um, in negotiating this factual, well, factual, but true telling that is also fictionalized with this uh, a bouquet of real characters who are who will recognize themselves in there one way or the other how did you negotiate that without just like going into hiding you mean writing about a person who is living who i know will then read the book <laughs> yeah in, in writing about them fictionally, because I've heard fiction well, writers And also say, writing about my husband, you know? Well, there's I, that. I mean, there, that that's a, you know, that can be pretty dicey, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I always had a respect. You know, there was a respect for uh, my characters. Um, I wasn't in the business of trashing anybody. Um, and if I felt that I was crossing a line, Dana was very kind about pointing something out that perhaps, you know, might better be left um, aside. And I 
And I adhere to that because, again, he gave me the gift of this story. And I did not want to abuse that. Yeah. The, um, the advice I always give uh, uh, creative writing students is you never set out to create a villain. Uh, but if there is a character who is misguided as such, um, you hand them the rope. You let them hang themselves. Yes. And so in Echiro's case, he, he if there is a villain, there, I'm using the word villain with the bunny ears around it. Um, if there's a villain, he comes across as the person who made the most questionable choices. Yes. For his own reasons, which we come to understand. But in portraying him as the, the instigator, I guess, of sort of the heartbreak that goes on in the course of many lives and separations and choices and decisions, he is sort of the catalyst for all of that. Yes. Um, perhaps easier because he's passed on. He can't, you know, there's no other version of events out there. But was that harder to come to? You know, when I started the book, I didn't think of him as being, uh, for lack of a better word, a villain in the story. Yeah. Um, I had tremendous sympathy for him, but as I wrote his character and saw the his lack of ability to fight um, and his constant blaming on somebody else, and he'd get to a certain place in his life where you think, oh God, he's going to make it, he's going to make it, you know, and you're pushing him up the hill. Yeah. You've got your hands on his ass. And I know. Saying, Go, so bring him up. And then he just <laughs> slides back down, you know, to the point where you just lose your sympathy for this guy. Yeah. Even though we know, you know, it was the drugs, it was the illness, it was his own terrible childhood, it was his the own losing of his mother to tuberculosis. It was the fact that his father basically kicked him out of the house. I mean, he had so many strikes against him, but that's true of so many people. And they still manage somehow, you know, to persevere. We only, what is it, Mary Oliver? We only have one wonderful life to live. And, yeah. you know, that poem, The Grasshopper. Um, he, he just couldn't, he just couldn't um, embrace life. Yeah, and it seems as though his, I, I've known people who can't exactly embrace life, but they don't like spread it like a virus. So right. in his case, it seems as though it infused itself into the lives of a lot of other people. Yes, and yeah. what I found so, for lack of, I mean, forgive me for saying despicable, was the way he was cruel to um, Noriko. You know, it, it, it was almost as if he couldn't control himself. You know, she'd say, let's go out. He'd get all ready to go. She'd wear a pretty dress. She'd try to, you know, buoy his spirits. And then he'd throw money at her and say, you go by yourself. I'm going to stay home. Yeah. You know, you just want to kill the guy. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and those were the scenes that were some of the most fun scenes to write, honestly. <laughs> well, you know, and if you have the the license of fiction, sometimes you can approach the truth more honorably because you're, be, you're being given license to find the truth as opposed to just relate the facts. And yes. that's what makes a really good fiction story really good. Yeah, I mean... Uh... What are we seeing? We're, we're, I think we're Lauren. Out of time. Oh, we're actually out of time. I don't want to. I don't want to interrupt you either. There's just a question in the chat. I thought I'd address, and and oh, okay, um, I, sure. I I think I I mean I think people are, would be okay with it. I would love to hear 
you read from the book, um, if that's okay. Um, but the first question, um, or first the question, uh, Linda asks, has the book been translated into Japanese? And I'm going to kind of piggyback and ask if there are plans to do so, if not. Well, it's my dream that it will be. Um, my publisher knows that I have this in my mind. Um, and however long it takes, it takes. But yes, I, I definitely want it translated into Japanese. I, I hope that there will be, you know, enough Japanese readers who will want to um, have the experience of reading this story. Yeah, for sure. Great. Um, and, and would you mind reading um, from the book for a few minutes? Well, I hadn't planned on it, but I could. Um, you must have I, a copy lying about somewhere. I brought it with me, but I don't know where, where I have put it. What did I do with it? I, I thought I had it over there, honey. You asked me to bring it over. Yeah. What did I do with it? I may have to... Um, turn you down my dear you know that's okay, okay. hopefully that that uh you know you that want me to read from her book great oh yes <laughs> please do please do I, I would not i would not i would not deign to <laughs> oh, oh yes pick friend. a small passage that you like sure well i'd have to i'd have to dig out the book oh okay let's minute. see what did i do with it Dana's looking around. I brought it upstairs. You have to forgive me, Dana. Oh, here. Okay, let's see. Oh, this is going to happen. Um, this is going to happen. <laughs> okay, yes, we're going to make it happen. Um, I'll just read the ending. How's that? Perfect. Should I just, should I just read the ending of the book? Yeah. Um, maybe that's a good way of wrapping things up. Um. Let's see. Oh, and I will say, um, Lauren, just in mm -hmm. case we end up using this, the reading audio for um, the right question or for MTPR, if you're going to read a passage, um, if you have to turn a page, feel free to pause before you turn the page and then start reading again. And we can edit out the, the actual turning of the page. Um, just make it, make the audio and, and make Peter's life a little bit better on, on his end. Okay, all right. So um, this is the very end and, and uh, Hisashi is giving uh, Noriko a, a photo album as a way of sort of you know, giving her a glance at his life as the best he can. Turning the pages of the small photo album, my son narrated some pictures. This is me when I became an American citizen. That's the judge with mom and dad. I'm wearing a dorky powder blue jacket and black pants with a bow tie that someone gave my parents before I even got to Glendive. That's your picture of me on the high school debate team. He laughed. I'm the Japanese kid with the thick black glasses. My parents didn't, didn't go to the state championship to see me win. Too busy working, I guess. I interrupted him. That was a huge accomplishment. Were you disappointed that Mitsuko and Harry weren't there to see you win? I guess so, but we were hardly ever together as a family. My dad worked during the day and my mom worked at night. And to tell you the truth, I wanted to hang out with my friends. Usually we were pulling typical high school pranks. My parents didn't know much about what I was up to. He then turned another page of the album. And here's a picture of me at my graduation from Dawson County High School. And here's me with mom and dad right before I went into the Navy. Dad was so proud of me for going into the military. Did you have a girlfriend, Hisashi? No, maybe someday. Looking closely at each picture, I said, I've missed out on so much. He shrugged his shoulders if words could not convey the pain of lost years. I've missed out on a lot too. I think, it, what, I think about what it would have been like had I grown up in Osaka. Maybe if I hadn't left, Ichiro wouldn't have done what he did and we'd just be a typical boring Japanese family. I had the same thought, but it was too painful to dwell upon. Mr. Sugimoto interrupted. It's almost time to leave. I have something else I want to give you, Noriko. 
he handed me a jewelry box. Shall I open it now? It's customary for Japanese not to open a gift in front of the person who gives it to them. I think you can break that rule in front of it, in front of an American. I didn't want to waste a minute. I'll open it later. You tell me if you like it. I want, I want to, uh, I went to a bit of trouble picking out something for you since I don't know your taste or what you need. So, um, uh, um, I touched Hisashi's cold cheek. You aren't sorry you came to see me. No. He paused. Is it okay if I call you mom? And I'll try and remember to call you Dwight. I like the way Hisashi sounds better. When we're together, call me by my birth name, Hisashi. Hisashi Ushida. Hisashi Ushida. Yes, it suits you. I waved to Mr. Sugimoto. Please take a picture of Hisashi and me. Mr. Sugimoto took out his camera and shouted, ready. Hisashi and I both smiled into the camera. Then I slipped his father's scissors and the little prince into the pockets of his jacket. So you don't forget. As we climbed up the hill toward the inn, it started to snow. Hisashi turned up the collar of my coat to protect me from the wind, just as Ichiro had done so many times before. Then my son held my hand. I took off my gloves so I could feel his fingers wrapped in mine. The lantern along the pathway up the hill toward the inn turned on and lit our way through the falling snow. Hisashi nearly missed his train back to the Navy base. The winding road down the mountain was slick with snow and ice and the traffic moved at a frustratingly slow pace. Visibility was poor as the winter storm built to a near whiteout. The incessant sound of wipers hitting the windshield unnerved me. We passed several cars that skidded off the road and into an embankment. No one spoke, each of us engrossed in our own private thoughts. Hisashi looked relieved when we reached the railroad station with a few minutes to spare. He kissed me goodbye and climbed onto the train carrying his duffel bag. I stood on the station platform, the Tokyo Yokozuka sign brightly lit above the tracks. The public address system announced the departure time, the voice echoing against the tile walls as passengers bundled up against the nighttime cold hurried past me. Settling himself in a seat by the window closest to me, Hisashi waved as the train pulled out of the station. I mouthed the words, you are my sunshine. I reached into my coat pocket for the box and opened it. A beautiful gold-faced wristwatch was cradled inside. Winding its mechanism, I fastened the clasp, pressing hard so it would be secure on my wrist. I held it close to my ear, hearing its ticking above the din of trains arriving and leaving the station. Time lost, time passing, time ahead. It was all there, marked by the hands on the face of my watch. I didn't know when I would see Hisashi again, but he had made me a promise. In the meantime, I waited. One of the images that comes clear to me at the very end of that, that it's not only time, but it's also the mark of a heartbeat. And yes. Was, you know, yes. So thank you. Thank and you. I'm, I, I'm actually going to um, push everyone's patience a little bit more here. Um, <laughs> uh, if I could ask you, Lauren, to um, reread a couple parts of that, just so we have have. Uh, solid audio, if that's okay. Um, if you could read uh, the point at which you write, I think about what it would have been like. Um, okay. And just like the full sentences. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's also another point and I'll, I'll and um, I guess I can, I can certainly address that after. Okay, um, let me yeah. see. Um, forgive me, I'm trying to find it. No, that's okay. Uh, and just because we're on, we're still on and going and this event is still <laughs> happening, um, I encourage uh, our attendees who are still here uh, to put questions for Judy and Lauren and Dana into the chat if you have them still or continue to post really uh, kind comments in the chat, uh, which have also been, been going too, so. We'll answer almost anything. 
Actually, at a picture, I said I missed out so much on so much. I think about what it would have been like. That's the that's the note I got. In Japan. Uh, oh yes, I missed out on a lot too. I think about what it would have been like had I grown up in Osaka. Maybe if I hadn't left, Ichiro wouldn't have done what he did, and we'd just be a typical boring Japanese family. Okay, and then um, one more uh, beginning. There's something else I want to give you. Let's see. Spoken by Noriko to Hisashi. Oh, I have something else I want to give Noriko. He handed me a jewelry box. Shall I open it now? It's customary for Japanese not to open a gift in front of the person who gives it to them. I think you can break that rule in front of an American. I didn't want to waste a minute. I'll open it later. Okay. Does that work? I, I, I think so. I think so. Beth Ann, uh, sound engineer, is on the other side and is just messaging me here. Um, and, and we could also, um, after we let the audience go, we could certainly have you re-record the segment sure. too um, sure. while your memos is still going. But yeah, that's that's great. I think that's a, that's okay. a great way. Um, I'm going to give the audience one more opportunity. Throw your questions into the Q&A. Um, if you have them, I'll look uh, right before we, we say our goodbyes, but I do want to say some official goodbyes. A huge thank you to Judy and Lauren and Dana for joining us tonight. Thank you, audience, for being here, um, and thank you, Beth Ann, for Peter for being Beth Ann and Peter for being uh, on the back end of things again. Um, and I want to thank our event sponsors as well: uh, Arts Missoula, our fiscal sponsor, Whitefish Review, and MissoulaEvents.net. And I also want to make sure, and this is um, something I didn't put at the top, but I also want to make sure I'm thanking Humanities Montana and the Washington Foundation, both substantial. Uh, supporters of the Montana Book Festival. And just as a reminder to our audience, you can purchase Lauren's book, All Sorrows Can Be Born, at Fact and, Fiction's bo Fact and Fiction Books. Uh, be sure to enter the code MBF when you check out on their website, which is factandfictionbooks.com. Um, or you can vocally say the code MBF to a bookseller if you're buying the book in store. Um, I also I'm gonna put it out there. I urge you to uh, purchase Montana Book Festival merchandise at montanabookfestival.com. You can also donate there so we can continue uh, events like this. So oh, I wanna um, thank everybody. Um, it takes a village or more than a village. <laughs> and a special shout out to Judy for being so gracious and such a wonderful um, interviewer and to the, all the team at the Montana Book Festival and at NPR and affiliated stations and sponsors, like, what do they say at NPR? Like viewers like you, right? Yeah, <laughs> Such thank as you. viewers like you. <laughs> and, a, and a thank you to my husband. Absolutely, mm. thank you. Oh, and, and it looks like we, we do have a question. Uh, Kima Waterfield, who some people know, she's a memoirist in her own right, uh, writes, now that you're through with the process of shaping a true story into novel, is there anything you learned from the process that you'd do differently if you had to start over? Um, I think not. I think it, the journey is the journey. You know, you just, you just, um, um, uh, E.L. Doctorow says you turn on the headlights and you drive down the road and you see just about as far as the headlights are and you keep going. Yeah, and I'd, I'm not sure that every story is the same journey. So even if you were to recreate this book in some form, um, it would be a different adventure. And yes, so definitely. I wish there was some magic formula, but there really isn't. <laughs> there really isn't, no. No, and Kima's book is worth the pickup as well. Just saying, Inside Passages. Inside Passage, yeah. Um, and Kima will actually be on another uh, Montana Book Festival panel with um, Annie Canole and Catherine Raven uh, this weekend, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so I urge everyone to check that out as well. Um, I'm gonna actually ask Beth Ann, um, 
to come on. I don't know that she's, she might not be coming on or maybe Peter, just to make sure, I wanna make sure we've got audio here, um, just to make sure. And so while that's going on, a shout out to Timothy Cook, who has uh, messaged Dana to say the last time he saw him was in 1979 when you graduated. And uh, other than the distinguished gray hair, he looks the same. Oh. And it was interesting to learn something about him that I did not know. So oh. there's a shout out from the past, which is always fun. That is All great. Right. Bethann, are you, are you here with us? I just wanted to make sure that we've got everything we need before we go and that Dan, uh, Lauren, I think you're comfortable re-recording the passage, but Bethann, I wanna check in with you first. Thank you, yeah. And let me plug this back in, otherwise you'll have a lot of echo. Um, just, yeah, if Lauren can, if you don't mind, re-record that segment even right there while you've got the phone running and you're in the same location, that would be great, otherwise, I will know for sure when I start recording, but yeah, all signs are good that I've got. So do you want me to read the whole thing all over again, or? If you wouldn't mind. Um, do we do we need to be on Zoom for that? Should we um, end this or <laughs> or should uh, we have Lauren just re record it to Because I phone? can do it independently. Yeah, that's what send... I was thinking. Uh -huh. I yeah. think that's, that's the better have... option. We yeah. have everything on the iPhone and I'll just add an extra chunk of re-recording yep. re what I just read and hopefully it will be clear. Okay, here's, here are two requests. You don't even have to pause the voice memos. You can just let it keep rolling and re-record this as part of that same file you've already been recording. And I guess Dana perhaps could serve as your, uh, your listener, your listening post. And if either of you catches an error, Here's what you do. You back up to the start of the sentence that included the goof and start again from that point, if that makes sense. Sure. Good. That'll probably cover. Okay. okay. Thank all you. Right. I hope I get to see all of you next year in Montana. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. We're not crawling <laughs> with bugs. <laughs> Um, okay, thank you so much. Yes, come and visit Montana when we're when we're a little bit safer and numbers are lower. Um, and again, I want to thank everyone for being here and for your patience and 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 you know being with us as we walk through um, both a YouTube video on one end and a radio recording on the other. So again, uh, thank you, Judy, Dana, and Lauren um, for being our guests of honor. Well, thank you so much. All right, everyone, have a wonderful night. Talk to you soon, I hope. Bye-bye.